All right, so if we draw this graph, now I need to, hang on, I need to, all right, so if you take the calculator um, image that you just saw and you're going to sketch it, let's do that in the screen, um, we're going to sketch this image. And um, one, they're both lines, right? So they should look straight if we draw them well. And one of them is a very steep line, something like this, right? My graph is not going to be perfect. I'll tell you that in advance, just in case you were hoping. Um, so we've got this line right here that's in red. This is actually my line that represented my function f of x. It's the 5x. And this one's the plus one for f of x. So this is what it looks like. It doesn't quite go through the origin like mine's sort of showing it does, but this is your image more or less. And then your other line, um, it looks like a very shallow line, something like this. Again, it, it shouldn't actually hit the origin with this particular equation, so this graph is not perfect, but they have this sort of an image going on. And this right here would be g of x. And then if you draw the line, um, and I will draw this line as the line y equal x, it would look something like this. And it should look more or less like it cuts the graphs as mirror images along them. So this right here is the line y equals x. Okay. So this image, if it's drawn well, would show graphically, visually, that they are inverses of one another. Any questions on that? Okay. And um, we're going to do a little bit of fill in the blank, kind of like you do in church on Sunday mornings, right? The pastor does this sometimes, at least mine does. Um, a function, we're talking about functions that are one-to-one. -one. Um, I can't remember if we mentioned this on the first day of class or not. I think we might have mentioned it in passing. A one-to-one -one function is a function for which every y value corresponds to a unique x value. That is, if f of a equals f of b, which are y values, right? So if the two y values are equal. Oh, I did. That's interesting, isn't it? Not all that helpful. Let's try again. How about that? You like that one better? That'll work better. So if you have two y values that are equal, f of a and f of b, then the only way that could have happened is if the x values would have been the same to begin with. And we talked, when we did this before, I'm remembering now, that we did talk about the horizontal line test, again, in a sort of hand-waving way, right? This is a graphical test that decides if a function is one-to-one, -one, right? So you can use the horizontal line test, and we talked about um, one graph that you're very familiar with that fails this test is the graph of x squared, a parabola, right? Almost every line I would draw would cross the graph twice. And if it were one-to-one, -one, it would only cross the graph in, at most, one place at a time, right? Um, strictly monotonic, this is a function which is strictly increasing or decreasing on its entire domain. Uh, in other words, it doesn't have portions where it increases and portions where it decreases, and it doesn't have any you know, flat spaces on the graph or anything like that, constant spots. It is always increasing or it is always decreasing, and that's called strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. And just like um, if you think about the words brother and sister, we have a much more generic term for the words brother or sister. We can call them siblings, right? And then that's a gender-neutral sort of word describing both. This is the same kind of an idea. Monotonic is a neutral word describing that it's either decreasing or it's increasing, and then we can sort of be more generic about the description. Um, an existence of an inverse. So we talked about how to decide if the functions that you're given actually are inverses. We did it analytically. That was with the algebra. We did it with a graph. And so we'd kind of like to know in advance when, in fact, a graph has an inverse. And the first thing um, is that a graph has an inverse if and only if it's one-to-one. -one. Hence, the need for the previous slide, right? 
So if we have this property that we have a graph that passes the horizontal line test, then we know that that graph's function is a one-to-one -one function, which means it will have an inverse. Now, how does this whole idea of being monotonic relate? Well, if f is strictly monotonic on its entire domain, then it's one-to-one. -one. And therefore, it has an Oh, you guys are letting me down. An inverse, thank you. One-to-one -one means it has an inverse. So all functions that are strictly monotonic have inverses. That's what that tells you, all right? So let's take a look at a function. We're going to use the horizontal line test to determine if the function is one-to-one, -one, thereby having an inverse. So grab your calculator, take your calculator, and put this particular equation 5x square root x minus 1. You'll need to make sure that is in parentheses, so it should look like this when you type it in. So it'll have a square root. Yours may or may not do this, but you should have a parenthesis, then x minus 1, and close the parenthesis when you plug it in. Is that on the graph you see? All right, so our graph looked something like this. Uh, we know it's not a line. It almost looks like a line from that picture, doesn't it? Because it looked fairly straight, but... If you look at that equation, you know that equation is an equation of a line. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, you know it's not. So it's got some kind of curving feature going on. If you want to be real careful, you could actually zoom in and zoom out and kind of play with the graph to see what's happening. Um, that's really not the point of the problem, but it, has, it does have a curving kind of feature going on. This is actually more of what it looks like if you play with the, the uh, x and y axis a little bit more. But the point is to decide if it passes the horizontal line test, and the answer is yes. Therefore, it is one-to-one. -one. And has an inverse. Make sense? So, as long as you can draw the graph, the problems that ask you to do it with a horizontal line test are, are pretty straightforward. Now, once we know that it has an inverse, the question is going to be, how do we find it? Finding an inverse, right? Hang on. All right, so the first thing you have to do to decide if it has an inverse or find the inverse is to determine if f of x is, what do you think? One to one. That's the very first thing. If you've got a function that's not one to one. All right. So the first thing to determine is if it is one to one. And then once it is one-to-one, -one, like the last problem was, the question is, what do I do next? So the first thing you do is you let f of x be replaced by y. So you, instead of having f of x, it's going to have a y in the equation. The next thing you do is you switch the x and the y variables. After you've switched them, you solve for y. You're almost done at this point. After you've solved for y, you replace the y with the f, of, f inverse of x notation that we saw before. And then you define the domain. The last thing you do is you verify your answer. You could verify it graphically. You could verify it analytically. Either of those would be appropriate. By, um, by and large, I'm not going to ask you to verify and show me your verification, but this is one of those things where you have the opportunity to check your work even if it's an even answer, right? It, you don't need a back of the book. You could verify it for yourself. All right, so I think we need to find one. All right, so we have this equation, f of x equals x cubed minus 1. The first thing says to find the inverse function of f. So almost ingrained within the directions indicate to you that it does, in fact, have one, right? Um, if you were to graph it, and I'm not going to do it with you right now, but if you were to graph it, let me show you what it would look like. I've drawn one almost before. The graph would look something like this. Okay. That same curved feature I had before, but it's been shifted down one because of the subtraction of one at the end. And if you look at it and you draw horizontal lines, it, it passes the horizontal line test, right? Okay. So, so it does pass this test. So the first thing we're going to do then is what after we've verified that it has an inverse? What was step two? Replace the f of x with y, right? So I have y equals x cubed minus one. Then what do I do? So 
switch the x and the y. So instead of it saying y equals, now it's going to say x equals, and instead of it saying x cubed, now it's going to say y cubed. And the minus 1 stays because it's not an x or a y. Step 4. Are we on 4? What's or step 4? Yeah, 4. 4, because the first one was actually the solve graph part. Y. Solve it for y. So how do I solve this for y? What do I do? Add 1. Add 1. So I've got x plus 1 now. Yeah, equals y cubed. And then I cube root. So my solution right now says y equals the cube root of x plus 1. Then what? Okay, so like this, Dylan? Yeah. Yep. So I have the inverse. I've got this cube root of x plus 1. And could I verify that it actually works? Sure. That's the last step, right? Make sure it actually is going to work. And how do we verify it? Graphically or analytically. Now, part B is actually going to have us do the graphical way, so we're going to just verify it in part B step, right? So on part B, it says graph F and its inverse on the same set of axes. So go ahead and grab your calculator, and you're really going to get me the graph now that I just sort of drew for you before. And so this right here is f of x. And if you do the other one, it was or I should say it will, look something like this. For f inverse of x. Does yours look like that? Did you get it, Kendra? Does it look something like that? OK, good. And when you're drawing these, it's going to be much more convincing if you draw that line y equal x in here as well. So that's the last thing I want to draw in here is that line y equal x because that line y equal x should, in fact, verify my suspicions. That is, it should almost look like it cuts the graphs and mirror images on each side. And that's the line y equal x. Any questions on the graphing part of it? Um, the last part, I'm sorry, there's two parts. One of the parts of this problem, the next part, rather, is to describe the relationship between the graphs. And I've verbalized it several times, so somebody tell me what you would say. How are the graphs related? They're inverse of each other. Well, that's why the functions are related, but how are the graphs related? Visually, what would you describe? Okay, mirror images how? Yeah, reflect is a really good word. Mirror images will work as well. So I'm going to use the word reflect. So um, let's say, let's pick one. f of x is a reflection. However we describe reflection, we have to describe over or around what? Right, it's a reflection around or over the line y equal x of the graph of f inverse of x. And I could have put the f inverse of x at the beginning and f of x at the end. It wouldn't matter. But this is the description. I mean, something of this nature, that they're reflections of one another, they're mirror images of another, and it has to indicate that it's around the line y equal x. All right, the last thing we're going to do, I think it's the last one on this particular problem, is to do the domain. Domain and range, actually, I think. Yeah. The domain and the range of f and its inverse. So let's do f first. What is the domain of f? Okay, so domain always has a start and an end. Domain is x values. I have any x value. If you want to think about the equation, the question you can be asking yourself on the equation is, are there any limitations to what I can let x equal? The answer is no. All I'm going to do is cube it and then add a 1 or subtract a 1. That I can put anything in that. So that's my domain. Range is a little bit trickier to think about in that way. But if you think about the range from the visual that we looked at on the bottom of the graph to the top, the range is also negative infinity to infinity, right? 
Now here's the cool thing about domain and range. Once you have found the domain and range of the original function, you already automatically get it for the inverse. Okay? Because all the inverse does, and this is hard to see in this particular problem, but all the inverse does is it switches the domain and range from the original function. So this domain down here is actually coming from the range of the original function. Because how did we find it? Well, we switched the x and the y variables. x variables related to the idea of domain, which are now becoming the range, because we switched them. And the same thing for y. So my domain is also negative infinity to infinity, but that's because the original one's range was. And the range is also negative infinity to infinity, but that's because the original graph's domain was. So once you find one, you get the other one automatically. All right. Last thing in this section, continuity. All right, so theorem 5.8 talks about continuity and differentiability. And here's what it says. Let f be a function whose domain is an interval i. f has an inverse function, and then the following are true. If f is continuous, then f inverse is continuous. I was right. There we go. If f is increasing, then f inverse is increasing. If f is decreasing, what do you suppose happens? Just take a stab in the dark. It's decreasing. f inverse is decreasing. If f is differentiable on an interval containing c, and we have to have the condition that f prime of c is, that's a c, doesn't look like one, let's try that again. f prime of c is not equal to zero, then f inverse is differentiable. Not on the whole interval necessarily, but if the original one was differentiable at, at the interval containing c, then this is differentiable at f of c, a specific point. And remember the reason the c became f of c is because we switched the x and the y variables. So c was the original x variable, so f of c would have been the original y variable and we switched them. Okay, so we have one example of this. All right, so this says, use the derivative test to determine if the graph is strictly monotonic and therefore has an inverse. So the derivative test, which you guys did last semester in Calc 1 or whenever it was you took your Calc 1, um, tells you the following. If you take a derivative and you find out that the derivative is positive everywhere, then it means that the original graph was increasing everywhere. If the derivative is negative, the original graph is decreasing. So you may or may not remember that, so let me write those down, just jot them down in a minute. So if f prime is positive, then f is increasing. And if f, um, f prime, sorry, is negative, then f is decreasing. So remember, we had a um, statement about monotonic that said if a graph is monotonic, then it has an inverse. Monotonic means strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. One way to decide if something's strictly increasing or decreasing is to look at the graph, right? But what if you didn't have your calculator with you, right? What if you weren't using it on that problem? Or what if you just had a scientific version or, or whatever? Well, how would you then know if the graph was strictly increasing or decreasing? Well, there's a real quick way to find out. If you find the derivative, you can decide if the derivative is positive or negative. And if the derivative is always positive or always negative, then the original graph was strictly monotonic. Okay, so we're going to go through that with this particular problem. So what that means I need to do is I need to take this um, function and I actually need to find its derivative. 
So I've got a function that also could be written how. How else could I write this function that's going to be easier to take a derivative of it? How? Good. 4x to the negative 2. A couple of you saying that. Good. All right, so let's take the derivative of that. So what is the derivative of 4x to the negative 2? Nobody knows. How about negative 3? Okay, so we subtract from the exponent when we're doing derivatives. I know we keep moving back and forth between derivatives and antiderivatives, so um, you have to be on your toes. All right, so this is the graph. Another way of writing this, or the equation rather, would be negative 8 over x cubed. Now, think with me about what happens. The first issue is um, this derivative. Uh, it has one place that is no good. What can this derivative, I'm sorry, let me say it that way. Yeah, I'll say it that way. What can this derivative never equal? There's one thing. It can never equal zero because I can never divide eight by something and get a zero. So this, this will never equal zero. Um, so what that's actually telling you is that f prime of x, I'm sorry, I said not equal to zero. I didn't put that in there. f prime of x does not exist. Oh, this is another feature. Um, just like f of x or f prime of x can't equal zero, f prime of x also does not exist when x equals zero. Because what would happen if x equal to zero? It would also be, it would be undefined. It would be undefined. I have a zero in the denominator. We can't do that. So um, take a look then. I'm on the white slide again. Um, so consider two options. We know we can't let x be 0, but we could let x be positive or we could let x be negative. Agreed? Yeah. So if x were positive and I took 8, negative 8, and I divided it by a positive number, what does this end up equaling? A negative number. It is a negative number. Correct? Excellent. And um, the reason it's a positive number is because I took a positive number and I cubed it, right? So when I took a positive number and I cubed it, it stayed positive. Okay. Um, let's do the same thing with the negative. If I, if I took the negative 8 and um, I divided it by a negative value, say negative 1, and then I cubed it. Did I have cubed? I do. Yes. All right, so if I take negative 8 and I divide it by negative 1 cubed, well, the denominator, I'm giving you an example of negative 1. What happens to that denominator when you cube that negative number? It's still negative. And what happens when you divide negative 8 by a negative number? You get a positive number. So you tell me, is this graph, not this graph, but is this equation always positive? Is it always negative, or is it part of both? It's part of both, right? Part of it's positive, part of it's negative. But what did it say I needed it to do? It always needed to be one or the other in order for the graph to have been inverse or for strictly diamond. monotonic. Hmm? For to have an inverse. Yes, so this graph, so let's say, Let's use the words I just used, something like that. So since f prime of x is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, what that tells us is that f of x is not strictly monotonic. Which means what? It doesn't have an inverse. Thus, f of x does not have an inverse. Now, the directions of the problem are the directions of the problem. How could you verify to yourself as well that your answer of f of x does not have an inverse is true?
How else did we decide if f of x had an inverse? If it has a monotonic. Are you talking about another one? If it was one to one. <coughs> and we found that out by graphing, right? So could we, we also take a graph of, let's see, 4 over x squared and see what it looks like? See if it passes the horizontal line test? If we did the problem right, it should not pass the horizontal line test, right? All right, so we're going to verify that to ourselves. Um, it's not going to, but I'll do it on the board before we're done. Let me stop this recording there for